Hello there, and welcome to the Unfuck Your Biz with Brayden podcast, a show to encourage and empower creative CEOs just like yourself through actionable legal, tax, and financial topics. I'm Brayden Drake, an author, lawyer, tax pro, and educator, but you can just call me Brayden, your gay best friend, here to help you unfuck that biz. If you're ready to dive in, grab a notebook, maybe some coffee, and buckle in to learn how you can implement solid strategies to build a profitable business. Well, hello there, friend, and welcome back to the podcast. Super excited to be joined today by uh, my friend, Denise Duffield-Thomas. So Denise has been on the podcast before. So if you missed the first episode, you can go back and listen. But today we're going to be talking about Denise's new book. She is the author of three books, the latest of which is titled Chill and Prosper, which gives a fresh and funny roadmap to living a life of abundance without burnout. Denise has helped 8,500 students from around the world through her signature program, Money Bootcamp, and describes herself as a lazy introvert and unbusy mother of three. She owns a rose farm and lives by the beach in sunny Australia. Hi, Denise. How are you doing? What did we even talk about last time? I can't even remember. <laughs> uh, we, I think we, we focused we mostly on money blocks. You're oh, um, tentatively going to be episode number 232. I've learned my lesson and I don't usually say the, the number of my episodes when I do my interviews. Um, but I think your original interview was like episode 60. So it's been a minute. Well done. That's a lot of episodes. That's really cool. Yeah. Yeah. I was doing um, two and three a week there for a while, which was not super chill. And we've dialed it back a little bit since then. Yeah. yeah. But still, that's, that's a real thing of like persistence and consistency. And, you know, when I started out doing podcast interviews, I said yes to everybody. Uh -huh. And people would say, oh, I'm starting a podcast. I'd love you to be my first guest. And I learned very strongly in that first year that often people want to start a podcast, but they never get around to actually getting those first episodes up. Yeah. So I remember I recorded heaps that would never see the light of day. And so I learned to say, you know, at least have a couple on your website. Cause then I know that you've gotten through the tech issues and, you know, cause I've Smart. had people they'd forget to hit record or if their microphone wouldn't work, all those things that, you, that happen at the start, Yeah. but it wasn't the best use of my time. I had to learn that. Uh -huh. Yeah, I, I did an interview one time and uh, the person ended up telling me that I was going to be their first guest. And then at the end of the episode, um, I was giving them tips on like how to record it next, <laughs> like how to record the next episode and how to, which, which was like totally fine. I always kind of take the, like my personal philosophy is like, you never know if you're going to be like the first guest on a podcast that's like going to be massively huge in six months. So, uh, and you feel like kind of get the warm and fuzzies either way. But I do think as uh, the demands on your schedule get more and more, you have less flexibility to do that. So that's actually one of the questions I'm going to ask you in a, little, in a little bit is like kind of how to manage those types of requests as your business gets bigger. But before we do that, I'm very curious. Um, your book, you had a book called Chillpreneur, which I think I listened to the audiobook. I don't know if I got the physical copy, but love, love, love. Can you tell us like who a chillpreneur is and what that means to you? Yeah, so it's not about working from a hammock in Bali, <laughs> which I think sometimes we see that, you know, kind of aesthetic. It's about creating a business that works for you and your personality. And that's can be the hardest thing for us, I think, because when you're starting a business, you don't know, you don't know anything, you know, you don't know how, um, what boundaries you need. You don't know really what you like to do or who you like to work with. A lot of that comes from trial and error. So a chillpreneur business is one that flows. It's in line with your strengths. It feels good. It fits your lifestyle goals. It fits your income goals. And it's utterly personal to you. Um, it, and I also think there is some, some sense there of, um, you know, creating an optimism that there is enough, that, that there's space for you. That is a tenant of the chillpreneur philosophy too, but it's not about doing business in a way that works for someone else. It's doing it. Know thyself and prosper is one of the chapters in there. Okay. I, I like that because like part of me was thinking, I was like, I often, I get bored pretty easily because I'm like, I'm like a go, go, go kind of person. I, I do not have three children. So I probably got like a little bit more time sometimes I'm like, what if I create a business that's so chill that I get bored? So I like to hear this. Uh, it all has to do with like, 
what is it that you want, right? And that's a big part of it. I have to bite my tongue sometimes because I see people <laughs> selling something and I know that they're that kind of person who gets bored because I've seen them do it 50 times already. Uh -huh. And, you know, they're like, I've come up with this great idea and I'm going to sell it. And they're really good at selling it, but it doesn't fit their personality. And then it comes either crashing down or I see them in a couple of months and they're doing something different. Um, and that's okay. There's a lot of people who have that kind of personality. It comes with being an entrepreneur, but you can find ways to make it um, be an asset rather than something that's a liability that means you crash and burn every couple of months. Yeah. Like learning how to, how to hone that skill for sure. So you are doing your new book comes out in when it, it's next month in July. What's in July, the launch yep. date? I think it's 19th or 20th. I can't remember because I'm a day ahead to the oh, rest yeah, of the world. Yeah, yeah. So I never remember yeah. if it's my time zone or <laughs> the US time zone. It's the 19th or the 20th of July. And that's when the Audible will come out as well. But cool. You know, people can pre order the paperback and the Kindle and the nice. You know, so this episode is going to come out on the 23rd of June. So people will have, you know, about three, four weeks. Um, I've already pre-ordered my copy. So I'm going to encourage everyone mm -hmm. to do the same. Uh, and we just added a new pre-order bonus, which we'll email oh. out to you if you're already on my list. It's um, I did a whole album of affirmation audios. Okay. So you can work or you can meditate and you can hear all these affirmations about business and money and success. And I love layering those in because I'm terrible at meditating, but it, it counts, right? If you're listening to it while you're doing other stuff. Yeah, I like that. Anything that I can just kind of like listen to either passively or actively is like a great time for me. So exactly. the book is titled Chill and Prosper. So is this, is this like kind of a, is it a new book or really an, an updated version of Chillpreneur? So it is an updated version and I'll tell you why. Um, I wrote, started writing Chillpreneur in 2017. Mm -hmm. um, and it came out in 2019. That's how long the publishing world takes. But something's happened in the last couple of years <laughs> that has completely changed our world and the way that people do business. And so my publisher last year asked me to do a, a, a new version. And, um, and I said, yeah, cool. But I didn't like the cover last time. And they said, great, we didn't like the name. And then we went, cool, let's, let's upgrade both of those things. The other thing is though, it needed, I really see that book's written pre-pandemic. Uh, there's just a little shit. There's something that's just not quite there. And so I'm really glad that I could do that and acknowledge the fact that the world has changed. But also the important thing is that people would write to me and say, well, that's great, but I can't do that in my industry because mine is special and mine has rules, Denise. And I really wanted to put in a, a ton of case studies. You're a case study in there too. Remember you submitted a case study? Uh-huh. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and we, we wanted to show different industries, different people, different personality types to show that you still can create a business that works for you and your personality. No one's exempt. And we know this now that even jobs that we never thought could be online had to be online, had to shift and change. We all had to pivot. Um, so yeah, I, I kind of was supposed to just do a little light edit on the book and I ended up rewriting the whole thing. <laughs> um, also because I wanted to put in examples of where I screwed this up since, since publishing the book. And then I screwed up heaps of things too, where I'm like, hey, I'm still learning to be a chillpreneur, guys. <laughs> Um, and then to incentivize people, if they had read the book before, that's why I did all the pre-launch bonuses and all the cool stuff. And I'm going to give you the URL now. It's at denisedt.com slash prosper. And that's where Beautiful. people can get all the pre, pre stuff. So there you go. I've ticked that off. Yes, Promoted. we ticked that off. We will get that. Um, my amazing VA will make sure that we have that in the show notes for everyone. So you can just, if you're on your phone, scroll down, click the link, buy the book, get the freebie, do all the things. So you <laughs> you mentioned that um you had all these people that were saying you know what that doesn't work for me like i'm in this i'm in this other industry that's what i got going on what were like specifically though like what were they saying what were they saying their objection was were they saying that a lot of your tips are for online business owners and they're like not online or was it something else i think sometimes it's a mindset of um the customer is always right 
And oh, if I yeah. do it like this, if I do it the way that I want to do it, I'll lose all of my customers. And it could be from really small things to saying, um, I mean, a lot of people said, I can't do my business online or I can't do it in a group setting or I can't, um, I can't write a book. I can't create a passive income thing around this. Um, one example is a lady, she does um, pelvic floor physio and mm -hmm. yoga for people who have pelvic floor issues. And pre-pandemic too, she was like, I can't do this. I can't do this online. Um, but what her real mindset issue was, is I have to do this one-to-one -one with anybody. I have to be affordable for anyone who wants to, to do this. Instead of realizing that when you charge win-win prices, when you have boundaries, so you're not burning yourself out, you buy back time that then you could create a book or a course or something like that that can help a lot more people. But also even just the boundaries piece I find is so mindset related because we feel like, again, the customer's always right or we have to be available for anything that people want. And we're often trying to build a critic-proof business with a critic-proof price and that's impossible. We can't do yeah. it. Yeah, I, I would imagine if you have, if I mean, if you have, if you have no critics, I would just think that that means you're like bending over backwards all the time to please everybody. And that's not super sustainable. Absolutely. And okay. So look at your industry, right? When I think of like tax and money and accountants or like lawyers, anything like that, where it's like an official, you know, industry, I always think of like a banker, like Mr. Banks in Mary Poppins, mm -hmm. you know, and I think sometimes when you go into an industry, you believe in the rules of the industry that it has to be this certain way. I have to be this certain way in this industry instead of realizing now, I mean, are, are you, well, are you going to talk about your new venture or is that a secret? Um, yeah, we can. I okay. think, I, I think I'm I've, I've, I've hinted at it you. a few times on the podcast. So that's a perfect example, right? Of going, I'm allowed to choose my target audience. Mm -hmm. I'm allowed to choose the flavor and the marketing that I want to do. I don't have to be, I don't have to do it in a way that everyone else has done. And I don't have to serve everybody. Yeah. So all, so to let everyone know, okay, I'm, I'm going to give everyone half the information. So I've kind of okay. hinted at a new business that I am starting. Essentially, it's going to be a tax service for a very niche industry that's outside of the industry that I'm currently in very niche, very exciting. Um, I'm not giving away all the details because I've planned a pot, like kind of like an announcement podcast episodes, which is really going to be like a business launch debrief for everyone, which, which I think will be kind of fun. Did you go through a, a, a process of going, no, but I have to, I have to serve this person or I have to serve everybody instead of, because I think when people niche down, sometimes that can come from a place of, um, fear, you know, of yeah. going, is there enough or am I allowed to? Yeah, I think I did earlier and earlier in my business. I did. Um, for me, here's the thing. I think one thing I know I've noticed is that, um, pretty well, when I started my business, I was already living with my now husband and I essentially had the privilege to rely on his financial stability. And I think that kind of freed me from some of the money blocks I otherwise would have had. Um, so I took, in my mind, I feel like I was able to take more chances, which in reality, I think if I didn't have that, I probably would have said, I don't want to niche down. And it allowed me to niche down, which actually was probably the thing that helped my business get started the fastest anyway. Yeah. Things sometimes of going, what's going to happen? What's the bad thing that's going to happen? Whether that's setting your first boundary with a client or increasing your prices, because that's a way of niching as well to serve different clients. And we can just get really fearful about it. But I think sometimes the mindset is, I'm not allowed to choose. I get what I'm given. Or if I make a decision, I have to live with it forever. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You mentioned uh, like a couple minutes ago, boundaries, like having boundaries with clients. I mean, I can come up with a few examples in, in my mind, but I'm sure you probably write about that, like in some somewhat fine detail in, in the book. What are some boundaries you think more people need to be implementing? I think it depends on what they offer, obviously, but um, a lot of the time it's 
we're doing it from a place of wanting to be generous mm -hmm. and we can over deliver in a way that's not actually useful for our clients. And so if you're in a coaching or transformational space, I find that people will have, you know, go over time. I used to have three hour sessions instead of one hour Oof. sessions because I wanted them to learn everything that I had ever learned in my life and be generous. I was over generous with bonuses and with things like that. And actually what happened for me is um, my refund rate on my course was going up and I couldn't figure out why. And so we got a bit of feedback from people who had refunded and they were saying, oh, I didn't have time. I didn't have enough time to do the course. And I was thinking, what a, like, no one's got time. But I realized that I had started to add in so much extra stuff because I was trying to be generous. So I have, you know, um, uh, like a thing about forgiveness, a video of me talking about forgiveness and money. And then I was like, and here's Oprah talking about forgiveness. And here's this other person talking about forgiveness. And here are three books on forgiveness. And I was trying to be generous, but people were buying the course, looking at all the stuff yeah. that they had to do. And they were going, I can't win at this. And so they were asking for a refund. And so that was a really perfect example with data behind it of where I was trying to be generous, but I actually was overwhelming people. Um, and I find that I had a, um, a friend who was a Facebook ad specialist and she would get the copy from the client and go, oh, this is crap. I'll just rewrite it for them. And then she was going, oh, their opt-in page is crap. I'll just, <laughs> you know, I know how to use that system. So I'll just fix it for them. And then she was like, but their sales page is crap. I'll just fix that for them. And she was ending up, in burnout and resentment yeah. because she couldn't say no to people. Um, and I've seen people quit businesses rather than just say no to people. Yeah. Well then at that point, your friend is, you know, providing like a $5,000 service after probably sending it like a $2,000 invoice, I would guess. Who knows what the numbers probably are. Probably worse. But, yeah. Worse. And because I work with a lot of female entrepreneurs, I find the money block stuff is, you know, the undercharging is rife in, yeah. in the female world, especially. And it's, but then they undercharge and over deliver. So then it's double whammy. Yeah. I was going to say pick one, but you pick, 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 pick neither. That's the, that's the answer. Well, it's right? that fast, cheap and good, right? They're trying to do all of them. Yeah. Yeah. That's, and that's always the, you see it in the triangle and they say you have to pick two, right? Okay. Gotcha. Gotcha. So I had another boundary question, just something I thought was interesting. Uh, when I contacted you to book this interview, you immediately sent me a link to your calendar, which I just thought was actually really cool. Um, I don't even have, I don't really have my own calendaring system. I've just found that they don't like work super well for, for me. So that was actually a really convenient way to schedule. But I know other people like, and I had this conversation with some of my friends, they're like, no, 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 I'm going to send you my calendar. Have you, do you ever, do you ever get that? It's kind of like a tug of oh, war with the calendars. I don't mind either way. The thing for me is um, I got diagnosed last year with ADHD. Mm -hmm. And so for me, when people say an open-ended question of when are you available? When do you want to do this thing? And it's like 50 emails back and forth. I'm out. I'm, yeah. I'm just like, I'm overwhelmed with the information. And so I know that um, if I can just say, here's my calendar, but I often say, but or send me yours. I don't care. Just make it easy and make it like, make it an easy yes, you know, for people, because otherwise a confused mind says, no, you know, if someone's sitting there and I go, when are you available? When am I available? Hang on. What's our time zone? Oh, wait, I'm a day ahead in Australia. So it's, you know, it's, it starts to become like this thing. But I noticed that a lot of, um, you know, practitioners or even businesses in town, they're like, call us up and make an appointment. We're only open from this time to this time. <laughs> For me, I'm out. Yeah, I'm done. I've forgotten about you. But, you know, there was, I was watching a comedy special with Ali Wong and she talks about how she was constipated. And I was like, oh, I'm constipated. I need a colonic. You know, finding a place in town, book it straight away, done. Because I remembered at 11 o'clock. Yeah. You know, if I have to remember the next day, I'm done. So I always try and find, um, and this is what I talk about in the book too, what can you automate as much as possible to re just reduce that friction? You know, some people will not buy something if PayPal is not an option because they have to get up and find their credit card or, you know, it's a bit easier now. People have got their credit card stuff saved in their computer, but you have to make it easy because you'll lose people each time you add an extra complication. 
Yeah, I like that. Okay, so you brought up, I so I had some questions about your ADHD diagnosis, not like medical specific questions, but I went and read, <laughs> I went and read yes. the page Let's on, yeah, on your, on your website. And I am, so I have not formally sought a diagnosis yet, um, but I have a friend who's a therapist for 15 years who basically told me, Brayden, I think it'd be well worth your time. <laughs> Well, worth your time. Uh, so, you know, she couldn't uh, ethically and legally diagnose me, but that's, that's where I am. I'm curious. Um, so you mentioned that you have ADHD, you were diagnosed as an, as, as an adult. Do you think, um, so you wrote the book, you wrote the first version of the book before your diagnosis, right? So I'm yes. curious, do you think having a chill business was partially also like a, a hack to your own ADHD, so to speak, that you like figured out on your own? Yes. It was literally a handbook for people with ADHD. And I didn't realize um, because so many of those things were trial and error for me. It was finding the path of least resistance through pain points. It was, you know, all of my automation stuff, you know, there, there was a chapter called Keyless Life. Uh huh. And one of the things they ask you in your ADHD diagnosis is, do you lose keys? <laughs> and I have lost keys my whole life. And that's why I put electronic keypads on my doors. And I wrote a whole business thing about, you know, automate and make things easy without any clue that I had ADHD. And so it's very obvious. I mean, I had it as a kid, very obviously, but I, all my family, have it now I realize in hindsight my cousins were medicated because they were um their behavior was really difficult and off the charts so they were diagnosed in the 80s 90s me though I would just read 20 hours a week and I just forgot you know to, to, I forgot everything but I was smart and I was quiet and I didn't cause a lot of trouble actually a lot of my teachers very early on realized just let Denise read a Stephen King book on her lap during the class, because <laughs> if they told me to turn, to do it, I'd be like, "This is on you now." I like that. This I, is on you. I think you I read, let me I, just sit and read. I was like, I think I read The Shining when I was in like sixth or seventh grade, and my teachers were like, "What are you doing?" Yeah, I like that. Yes, you, but it kept me from distracting the class or talking too much or whatever. But. I, I still absorbed some of the lessons. I'd either get, you know, like really good things or I'd get like 3% because I just wasn't. But I, it really helps me now. You know, I can be doing a video thing, reading a teleprompter of something I haven't even read, reading it out loud, seeing a mistake in the next paragraph, mentally changing that mistake in my head and also doing a shopping list at the yeah. same time. So it's so useful in so many ways, but it was getting to a point where it was, you know, it was, it was hard for me to do stuff and complete things and start things. And um, I only really sought the diagnosis because my son was getting diagnosed um, because he was one of the classic naughty, naughty boys. Mm -hmm. And, but it's changed, it's changed my life. And I'm always happy to talk about that. I am medicated for it. It's been amazing, but also there's a real, like, um, it was real sad for a little while. Cause I was thinking, oh man, this is what I, this is, I could have done things a lot earlier in my yeah. life. And um, even, you know, if, if this is not too personal, like it's, it's helped me lose weight because I'm not eating mindlessly. And, you know, I would overeat and because I had no dopamine, you know, and so I was getting pleasure from food. And so I've, I've lost a ton of weight and I'm like, my mom was always skinny. And I'm like, I was never skinny my whole life because I was trying to, get something else you know I was never a drug person but I was obviously eating to get some kind of pleasure in, in my brain and so I'm like ah oh, it sucks that I'm like super getting super hot in my 40s why wasn't I hot in my 20s that's not fair <laughs> yeah I per I personally always just wonder like how different my academic life would have been because what I found was I did I did really really well in the classes I found interesting and I did really not well in the classes I found uninteresting which was you know, interesting to now learn. You also you mentioned imagine. a key thing. Yeah. I now have, I carry a purse and I keep my keys on a clip on the strap. And then I have a hook that I put them on as soon as I get in the house. So they don't get lost anymore. Typically. Electronic keypads is the yeah. way to go. The it's keypad. so good. We have, yeah. We have, th we have three doors. So I might, I might have to look, I, I'd, I'd probably forget the, the key number though. <laughs> but ours are all the same, by the way, yeah. they're all the same. And um, 
it's just makes it so much easier because I know even as you know, when you, you have to put those systems into place, yeah. sometimes it does fall down and I just don't want to ever have to think about that. I'd rather use that bit of brain power for, for something else. So and, yeah. What does that look like? I think you said in the book, you call it, um, uh, what did you call it? A key, a keyless life. Keyless what does that, life. What does that, can you give us some more examples? Um, I feel like I have a lot of examples for the way that I do that in my business with the way we put things in Asana and, and, and some stuff like that. But what are some examples you write about in the book? Okay. So one thing that Mark and I used to fight about all the time is phone charges and <laughs> headphones and things like that. And so I bought multiple versions of those. So I'm, I'm talking to you. I'm on aftershocks here to listen nice. and I've got a lapel mic here as soon as I finish here, I'll put it on charge and it yeah. lives in my office. And it's things like that, that I don't then have to go, where's my thing? You know, where's my charger? Oh, my laptop. So I've got two laptops because I don't have to ever think like, is, is it charged? And so I do things like that because I know that I wouldn't remember otherwise. If I then took this into the house, you know, two minutes before the interview, I'd be like, guys who's stolen them so sometimes it's about like multiple versions of things but sometimes it's automation you know the fact that when someone books in my calendar with me the reminders get sent automatically yeah. when i book in something it get puts in my calendar the other thing is um around boundaries so i've got four interviews today and each one has half an hour in between because i set up my calendly that people can only book in maximum four meetings and there's half an hour built in. If it was me, I like when in the start of my business, it was back to back. And I would be like, I have got 20 seconds to go and pee quickly eat something while I'm on the toilet before my next interview. Yeah, And I, I would do that. still do that if it was up to me to book stuff. I need an, an assistant to go through my emails and be the first point of call on my social media because otherwise I say yes to everything. Yeah. And I and I say yes to projects and people and all those things. So I need those things in place, keyless life. So I don't have to think about it. And also I don't have to change my behavior because I find that behavior change is one of those really hard things to do. Um, and the cool thing is we've got a lot of technology that can help us with those things. So at university, I I failed so many subjects that I wasn't interested as you did, but oh, I'm not saying you failed, but <laughs> some of the things is out of sight, out of mind. I would completely forget that I had French until five minutes before my French class. And then I'd be like, I haven't done the assignment. Now I can do Duolingo and it pops up this cool thing of like, Hey, don't lose your streak. Hey, do you want to do the thing? Hey, press these cool buttons. Hey, we've got music. So it's like dopamine, dopamine. And so we live in this cool world now where we can find all the ways to make things easier for ourselves. See, I got, I feel like I got very lucky because I had a best friend in undergrad and I had a best friend in law school and both of, both of these individuals, shout out to Ingrid and Amy would text me the day before a big project was due. Hey, Brayden, don't forget we have a paper due tomorrow. Oh, oh, thank you. Thank you. I'll have to wrap that up. Uh, one thing one thing that we do in the business now that helps because I'm like constantly losing documents, like Google drive is a nightmare for me. I've given up on a folder system is we just have everything in Asana. So we have, um, a content calendar where all the, all the content goes. And then we have a weekly task board where recurring task goes and every task has to have a hyperlink to an SOP. If we have one or need one, or if it's not an SOP, it's a hyperlink to like, where are the Canva images in here? What's going on? Uh, I also like save any course login information I have there. Like if it's not an Asana, I'm not finding it. And that's something that's been helpful for me as someone who like literally can't remember anything. Absolutely. Last pass has been great for me for that too, because when I buy a course, I can just add it to the last pass and then yeah. my team have it as well. But it's those things of, I think. I used to try and improve myself by going, oh, I need to fix that thing that I'm bad at. I need to do a course. I need to overcome it. And now I just go, can I eliminate the problem? Who cares? Can I automate it? Can I delegate it? Can I batch it? Or can I um, hire someone just to completely take care of that? And then it's easier because yeah, you're not going like to change probably. That's like on the whole cord thing. I learned when I went to take my old MacBook to the Apple store, 
I think they told me they were like, oh, we only really give you like $10 for the charger if you just want to keep the charger. So I was like, okay, great. So now I have an iPhone charger and a MacBook charger in my office, kitchen, and living room. So I just never have to look for them, which is great. I need to get a fourth one for my for my uh, travel bag and then I'll be I'll be all yes set. the travel one exactly well we did it you know <laughs> when we built this house we were like you know the the couches there has to be one on each side in our bedrooms there has to be one on each side of the bed like as in a you know a, a powerpoint with a usb yeah um thing in there and we just have multiple charges everywhere because it was just it was just a pain point and it would be you know run out of battery or um and there's still so many things that I forget all the time that I just have to, um, you know, put heaps of stuff in my car. I really struggled with taking vitamins as well. And so I, there's sometimes I just go, okay, where will I remember? And so sometimes I keep things in my car because I'm sitting there waiting and I get bored and I go, Oh, I need to do this. I was thinking though, what, what I need to lock myself in my bathroom an hour a week without my phone so I use all of the things that I've bought because I'll get so bored that I'll finally go, oh, I'll use this pore strip. Oh, I'll use that face mask. Oh, I'll use that hand cream. Um, otherwise, I forget that they've existed. Yeah, too and many then new I beauty just, supplies. Yeah, yeah I, I get that. I shop at Kiehl's too much myself. Um, so I, I have another, like a, a kind of a series of questions on kind of the simplicity that I've noticed in your business, which is something I really admire. Anytime we chat, Denise, which is now the, the second time, I feel like it's like a cathartic journaling exercise for myself because I'm like looking at your business and taking notes. Um, you run like you, you run your signature program, Money Bootcamp. You've been doing that now. I think on your website, it says 10 years. And when I yeah. go to your website, there doesn't seem to be like a maze or a myriad of like upsells and downsells and cross sells and funnels. Like how, how have you managed to keep things like pretty streamlined? I would assume that's part of like what you also teach in chill and prosper, but I'm, I'm really curious. Yes. About that. And it's against my nature because I would love to start new things all the time. I am absolutely a shiny object person. The way that I've been able to not do it, one, we have a philosophy in the business, all roads lead to boot camp. Mm -hmm. That's our philosophy. If it doesn't lead to boot camp, it's out. Um, and also I created, when Mark came in the business, my husband, he was like, let's do a mastermind. Let's do this. Let's do that. And I made this light box for him and it says, sell more boot camps. Because it's really easy to think new, sexy, shiny. And then I just go, but I have something that yeah. people can buy. And the way that I trick myself is that I say, I can create anything that I want marketing wise. And so I let my imagination play in the front end of my business and I leave my back end alone. Okay. Gotcha. That's also my philosophy in my sex life. Leave my back end alone. Um, <laughs> but in, remember that, right? I'm always experiment in the front end, leave your back end alone for me. Um, totally different for everyone else, no judgment, but that's helped me because every time I get that itch to go, Ooh, I go, Oh, let's channel that into a fun marketing thing instead. And I only let myself redo money bootcamp every two years as in redo videos and stuff, because otherwise you can get so caught up in rummaging around and fixing things and changing things behind the scenes that no one ever sees that no one, that people don't care about that much. It gives yeah. you a little bit of excitement and dopamine, but it doesn't help you help more people. And what, the other thing that's helped me is having someone ahead of me with a similar target market. Because every time I think everyone's seen this program, it's, I go, Marie Folio has sold 70,000 people into her program. Mm -hmm. Could I find a couple more hundred? Yeah, I think I can. Yeah. And then I go, okay, cool. And so I've told myself, don't quit until you've, you know, sold more than her because it's proof to me that there's more people out there. So I, I am constantly wanting to tweak my programs. So I'm glad you brought that up. This is something I like just, just kind of dawned on me like a couple months ago, what I told myself I'm going to start doing. Um, I'm a very like forward thinker, which I think may be an ADHD thing, but I'm also, I don't know if you're super into the Enneagram, but I'm an Enneagram seven. We're like very future oriented. And so once I create something, it's like I create it, I sell it. And then it's almost like mentally dead to me at that point. Like I, for, like I forget about it. 
And so what I've done is I decided before I re-record any videos, I'm going to go back and watch my old videos and I'm going to go back and look at my old materials. And I'm not even kidding. Like a lot of the times I go back and I look at it and I'm like, this is really, this is really good. This is really good. I get like kind of proud of myself and I'm like, oh yeah, I don't, I like don't need it. I don't need to change this. But it's, it's an itch that needs to be scratched. Right. Yeah. And so instead of creating more bonuses for money bootcamp, I'll go, oh, I can create a freebie that will lead to money bootcamp. Yes. So you can still do the experimenting, but do it in a way that is useful, not a distraction, not a procrastination tactic, because it doesn't matter. You know, I've done it myself where I've gone, I don't like the shade of like the color <laughs> on my website, you know? And so I just go on this random rabbit hole of tr trying to fix that instead of going, it's, it's enough. It's okay. As it is sell more of them, help more yeah. people. And so then that's why you still get the excitement of the new thing, but it's leading to something. It's not, you know, just in your own imagination or for your own personal anal, you know, satisfaction. Yeah. Well, I think you've partially answered like the next, the next question I had for you, I actually noted, I love your affirmation. All roads lead to boot camp. I read that on your website. I think you noted it on the last podcast as well. But but for me, I feel like, and you've brought this up, it competes with this like multi-passionate thing a lot of us entrepreneurs have. So you noted that you kind of you kind of itch that scratch on the marketing side of your business. But I'm curious, like, do you find that you also have to meet that need like outside of your business, like through hobbies or through a different business? Or what does that look like for you? Yeah, and that can be tricky because I'm a, I'm a ruler personality type, which in money archetypes is all about um, what's next, achievement, no, no time off work only. And that can be really tricky because as soon as I start a hobby, like forward thinking like you, I go, oh, I could be like a champion at this. Uh-huh. Uh -huh. You know, I did swing dancing one time and I was like, did one dance and I was like, oh, I'm going to get a tutor to be the best swing dancer in London. And I'm going to, I was like, I could see myself winning a trophy of like the swing dancing competition. And I was like, oh yeah. And then it was like the dance ended and I just went, oh, cool. That was fun. And I'm kind of like that with a lot of things. I find that I can get a little bit excited about it. So sometimes I now I just go, well, that's fun. That's fun to think about. You don't have to do anything with that. You can just have fun thinking about it. And then the cool thing about my work is I can relate anything to money. So I'll, I'll just go on a little tangent with someone and just go, oh yeah, let's talk about, you know, hobbies and money. Let's talk about weddings and money. I can totally bring it all back down to what I do. But it means that um, switching off can be really tricky for me because I can see how you can monetize anything. Yeah. But it's not my job to do that. And so I, I love going to the movies. I go to the movies every Thursday at 11 o'clock with one of my best friends and I switch off for that. I make sure that I have massages so I can switch off. Literally, I'm paying someone just to hold me down <laughs> without my phone for an hour. I like that. I don't even works, care though. about the massage. I'm paying for the space. Um, I love musicals. So I've recently invested in a musical and I would love that to be part of, you know, my future is to do more stuff in that world. Um, but yeah, I love business, you know, and it can be really tricky because you can just sometimes never switch off when you have your own business, as you know, because everything, yeah. you, that thing, is, everything's I, content. I feel like this is why I've also just loved having a business mastermind, because for me, there's like few things I love more than to like get, we, we have a two hour call every month, but it usually ends up being a four hour call. And there's like nothing I love more than being on a four hour call with this group of people I've been meeting with monthly now for three years, I think just talking about business. It's so fun. Like if I could it's have so another, fun. I feel like if I could have another, another business, I would have a business where I just sell all of my business ideas to other people who need to start businesses. <laughs> okay. So this is a perfect example of people who are multi-passionate. They get in this tears thinking, I need to find the perfect business for me. And yeah. then I, they feel bad because they don't follow through on the business. Right. But there are people in this world who are idea generators mm -hmm. and they're not meant to follow through those businesses. You just have to find the mechanism to do that. And for some people, it's being a business coach, being an incubator for other people, just being a sounding board for other people. 
not taking the baby home and having to raise the baby till they're 18. But I see people who do that. They go, I'll sell this thing. And they're, they're bored with it a couple mm-hmm. of months later. Mm-hmm. It's not how they're meant to do business. They're an ideation person. I'm curious though. I feel like it's, there's, there's like kind of two sides to this, right? So there's the, like, you gotta, like, you gotta do what works for you. And then we hear other people who are like, well, consistency is the key and you have to be consistent. And I do think, I do think that there is like a, a, a certain point at which we need to say, yeah, I want to do all of the things, but like, I need to be disciplined enough to like still stick, you know, like stick to one thing at the same time. Because we've been told that ideas themselves don't have value. Ideas are a dime Mm -hmm. a dozen. So that people, they go, that's not an umbrella business. That's, you know, that's just airy fairy stuff. But if the, if the consistency in your business is I'm a person who always comes up with ideas and I, um, you know, help people solve problems, you can find a way to make that, that an umbrella thing. It's just that you don't have to follow through on all of those. It's, it's a bit complicated to understand, but I've seen one person do it really well in a membership. Her name's Elizabeth Goddard and she has a business membership and she sells different things every month in there. Yeah. You know, one month she might be an affiliate for someone who sells templates next month, like how to be an affiliate thing. She creates programs too. So she's found this umbrella for herself of going, I'm someone who solves problems. I'm someone that you come to, to ask who's the best person for X. She doesn't have to be an expert in any of those things. Mm -hmm. She has branded herself as the go-to girl for solutions. That's one way to do it. Another way could be that you just sell an hour of your time and you brainstorm people's businesses, or you create a mastermind where you can work on lots of different people's businesses and dabble. And the consistency though, is being a visionary, being an idea person, bringing fresh, fresh ideas into people's lives, because it's hard to understand if you're, if you're that person, a lot of people cannot come up with ideas themselves. I'm in the middle. I can come up with ideas, but I often don't create the space to do it. So I'll hire people to create space to help me brainstorm. I can do it. I just don't make the time for it, if that makes sense. So I'll hire someone. A good example for book, right? Hey House said, can you send us three examples of a book, t- book subtitle for Chill and Prosper? And I went, oh my God, this is like one of 50,000 things on my plate right now. I do not have the energy to do it. So I hired someone who is basically a professional brainstormer, said, mm-hmm. this is what I need to come up with. And we sat there for an hour. She did it live on a Google doc because ideas people aren't good at following through later. I see people do that. I'll send you the report later. They never do. So we did it live (laughs) on a Google doc. I said, here are some of my ideas. We looked at thesauruses. We did the thing. We came up with it. Bang. It was worth it to me because I didn't have, I couldn't create the space to do it myself. Yeah. And so I, idea people are very valuable in this world because not everyone can do it. Well, I'm, I'm taking note of that. If any of my listeners want to book time on my calendar just to brainstorm anything, you are welcome to do that. My calendar is open. We can do it. As you're talking about people- And you should charge for it. And you should oh. charge for that, right? Yeah. Oh yeah. I, I have an, I have my hourly, I think most people who listen know because I talk about it, but my uh, one hour strategy session is $400. Generally it's legal and tax consultations, but we could talk about anything. Um, and that's worth it for some people because- yeah. Sometimes you have more time than money. Sometimes you have more ideas than time or ideas than money and it's worth it. But I see people then like wrap themselves up in knots to go, oh no, but I need to find my thing because my, my parents called me a flake. And so it's like, well, you're allowed to be a flake. It's very valuable for people. I had, so I do a, like a monthly, not a monthly, like a quarterly call with a friend of, it's kind of like a business mastermind, but it's just the two of us. And we got on a call and within like 30 or 40 minutes, I basically like had her whole launch plan <laughs> planned out for her. Uh, and she was like, how did you do that? And I was like, I don't know. I just, that's kind of, just kind of what I do. Like, we're going to pick a webinar, come up with a topic. When's your, like, when you need to get people enrolled. All right, this needs to be your webinar date. And this is when you should launch it. And this is how you can, you have 15 ideas to promote it. Love doing that kind of stuff. See, but where I see people do that is that they buy the domain name for themselves. They map out all the fun stuff and then it peters out because as soon as they start doing it, they lose interest or it's too hard or they just, it's just not meant to be their business, you know? I relate to that so hard. Yeah. 
Yeah. On the on the flip side, I think it's so interesting. So a uh, couple of weeks ago, I had an episode with Amy Porterfield come out, and I always find it so fascinating that on her podcast, she's mentioned before that she's not an ideas person. And when they do launches, she has the hardest time coming up with um, ideas. And of course, she has a big team now that can help her. And I always wonder, man, I'm always kind of almost jealous. I'm like, what would it look like to run a company where you're not constantly distracted by new ideas? Like that kind of sounds awesome. But you know, we all have our super. I don't know. <laughs> ask, don't ask me. Um, but as I said, I've just set up the structure so I don't break it. Yeah. And I still, I still am tempted. Sometimes I still go, oh, I'm kind of bored with this now. Maybe I should do something else. Maybe I should, you know, close it down. And I'm like, are you crazy? You make millions of dollars. You help lots of people. Just because you're temporarily bored with it isn't a good enough reason to throw out this successful business. Get your juice from somewhere else, you idiot. And it's just enough for me to go, oh yeah, don't break it. Okay, cool. Nice, nice. <laughs> so what was what was the subtitle you ended up coming up with for Chill and Prosper? Oh God, I can't even remember. What is it? <laughs> um, the new way to make millions, grow your business and change the world, I think. Love that. And, you know, there was lots of variations of it, but I didn't have the space to sit down and come up with three to send to my publisher. I was like, uh. so I always just go, who can I hire to help me? You know, I, for my launches, I do the same thing as your friend. I hire somebody to sit down and just bounce ideas around. Because if I say it to my husband, who's my launch manager, he's like, oh, I have to do all of that. And I go, I just need someone who will listen to my crazy ideas and, you know, it just holds space for me to do it. Well, next launch, Denise, let me know. <laughs> Down yes, to chat that's anytime. A, yeah, that sounds like a great use of an hour. And like, you know, I think that sounds like an amazing thing that you offer to people. Yeah. 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 Could be, could be, could be real fun. We'll see. You'll give me, anyway, give me my, you're giving me my 15th business idea. We got to, I got to define But it's not, it's, you've already got it. You've already got it on your calendar. So you don't need to start a whole thing about it. You True. don't even need to start a, uh, like a sales page. It's literally like, yeah, you cool. You got a problem. Here's my calendar. Um, and that's what I say about um, if people are constantly picking your brain, you can say, great. That's exactly the kind of question I answer in my one hour pick my brain session. Here's the link. You don't go and start a whole new business for that person. And then they go, well, I just thought I took that. Great. That's exactly what I talk about in my pick my brain session. Here's the link. That's and such a good note because I, so I don't really get that. I know a lot of people get this. I do not get this. And maybe, I don't know if it's because like I'm an attorney. So people like, it's like, I feel a little less approachable to people. I don't know, but I do not get inundated. Maybe I just don't feel approachable. I don't know, but I do not get <laughs> inundated with coffee chat requests really. Yeah. But I have a lot of friends who do um, serve, like most of them are service-based business owners or like wedding planners, photographers. And yeah, I think that's a great tip that you talk about in the well, book. Is... Do you know what? That's it's very gendered in that yeah. way, right? Because makes sense. From like from a young age, little girls in general are told to be helpful, are praised for being helpful. And so it's it can be really hard for women to go into business because suddenly we're putting money and we're putting boundaries around our help. And often, you know, for any, anyone of any gender, when you go into a business that you really truly love or you see that there's a massive problem, it can be really hard because of course you want to help everybody because it's part of, you know, how you get juice as well, sometimes solving problems. But it's okay to charge for that too. And that can be really tricky for people. That's why I always say just when in doubt, sell an hour of your time, mm -hmm. link, link to your calendar, put a, put a monetary value on it. You don't need to start a whole business around it. Yeah, my business um, drastically changed when I had a group of good business friends who encouraged me to increase my hourly consulting fee from one hundred to three hundred dollars, like overnight. Yeah, that was huge. And uh, did you have mindset issues around it? Did you think no one's going to pay this? Or I did, I did, um, and I don't even really know why. Because like at that point in time, like three hundred dollars an hour was a pretty reasonable hourly rate for an attorney, like in San Diego. But I, my issue, this was actually my issue is I was treating it like an entry point into my world, into my funnel. So it's like, oh, I'll charge less. But I also really resisted doing larger scope work. And I now don't provide larger scope work on a one-on-one -on -one basis. 
Um, so it's like I was selling a $100 hourly thing, but then like really probably finding ways to not upsell people on the back end. I really just wanted mm -hmm. to do the consultation. And now I've learned that and, you know, and not have the responsibility. Yeah. Right. And not have not have to do it for them, which is totally an ideas generator person as well. Yes. I also yeah. find that those of us who have had corporate jobs before, you know, our, our companies set our day rate, they set our billable hours. And then suddenly when you work for yourself, it's almost like it's not impersonal anymore. Suddenly we're like, we're putting a value on ourselves. Like it's, it feels more, I don't know, it feels more personal. It feels like, oh, hang on, what is my value to people? And we, we put it in like, in morality terms almost yeah you know instead of uh, my when i was in consulting they just set a day rate and literally if i did one little course or read a book they're like oh that's worth more let's up your day rate for your clients it wasn't my salary pretty much stayed the same but it was impersonal to them but for me then it was like oh but it's me denise what if they don't like me <laughs> we could do we could do a whole podcast episode on the kind of discussion around like the value of your service does not eat like is not equal to the value of you as a person <laughs> so something i've i've talked about because yeah. i what i i could go down such a long tangent but i do think most people undercharged but i do think there are some yes. people who come out of coaching programs who then are wanting to charge high ticket prices for things that are not necessarily high ticket services and it's like it doesn't mean that you're not valuable it's just we have to you know look at what we're providing i don't know one of my personal things it has to be energetic win-win yeah it really does and i found that um when i undercharged like i could feel that in my body i could really feel it and it started happening for me i was fine charging for money boot camp i was like yeah it's worth it you know buy it i had no problem around it at all but i started um getting a lot of requests to speak at people's events and conferences mm -hmm. and i it was like i was starting my money mindset journey all again because i was like but I don't, I don't prepare. Like, I don't feel like I'm a great speaker. I don't like doing it. So I'm not allowed to charge for it. Cause I'm an introvert. You know, I, and it was almost like, well, I'm, I get really nervous. So I have to take off a couple of hundred dollars for that. You know, I, I don't prepare slides. So I'll take a couple of hundred dollars for that. And I, so I just said, I don't speak, but then I would do it for my friends. Yeah. And then I would, I would feel, I would feel it in my body, how much it was out of alignment with what I was giving out versus what I was getting back. And I could, I remember getting in a cab and just going, oh, I feel sick and my whole body was hurting because I, I didn't value what I was doing and what I was giving. And I find that the money mindset work, you have to do it all the time because there's always gonna be a new little thing that comes in that you go, but I'm the exception. You know, I can't charge just for brainstorming with people. That's not a real thing. And then it's like, you have to start all over again. So is speaking off the table for you now, or is it just something you charge more for? I do. I mean, I had to sit with it and pick a day rate and just go, and I don't charge a ton in the grand scheme of things. I charge yeah. eight grand to come and speak at someone's thing, but it was almost enough to go, I don't want to. So I'm just going to put this number on it. Sure. And then every now and again, someone pays it and I go, yeah, okay. But if people we'll do, do want to hear you speak, they can tune into your podcast anytime. Right. I have a podcast and I batch it. I yes. sit and I record like 17 episodes in one go. And, well, I um, had, so I also, I had question. I had some questions about batching. I had a few other questions, but Denise, yeah, I know that you have some, I was like, I know that you have some other interviews today. Do you, do you Let me check. Time? Well, I've got half an hour between each one. Remember? <laughs> so my next one is in 25 minutes. Oh, hang on. Is that right? It is in 25 minutes. So let's go for another 10 or so, because I would love to talk about batching because it really brings together a lot of the things we've already talked about. Okay. I, ha I have a two for, I have a two for question on the podcast though. So go for it. I'll ask you the first one and then you can kind of lead into the batching. So my first one was going to be, so, and, and again, I know that you said like chill is a little bit different for everyone, but I would assume that for you, based on what you've said so far, chill means kind of like a less is more approach. So did you have any resistance to doing the podcast introducing one more thing into your business and if so how did you pass that um did i have resistance to creating a podcast no i actually did a podcast a long time ago this isn't my first podcast 
because I was recording videos all the time. So I just got my team to rip out the audio uh -huh. and just put it on a podcast. Um, and no, I didn't particularly have a resistance for it, but I knew I wanted to make it really easy. So what I do is I hire a podcast studio for like one or two days and I have a bullet point list of all the things I want to go through and I sit and I record as many as I can. Um, and you and do, you do like really yeah. big batches, don't you? Like, like six yeah. months at a time or something. Yeah. 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 Because why not? And then I only want to touch it once. And then my team, then they can do all the recordings at once. They can do all the transcriptions. They can do all the graphics at once. And then we schedule them out. And yes, we move things around if we need to, but um, yeah, I, I just like doing it like that because when I'm in a mood for something, I just want to just go blah and just, mm -hmm. I don't want to switch around too many different things. And I just really like getting in the mindset of it, of just, I'm sitting here and I'm going to record it. And then I, the problem though, Brayden, this is the seven, the Enneagram seven, right? It's, you always take it too far. So I'll batch like this, <laughs> but then I go, what else can I batch like that? So instead of going, oh, I'll work like this and then not work for three months. I'll be doing something like that every week because I'm always finding something new to batch at that intensity. Uh -huh. So then you live life at that intensity if you're not careful. This this was me last week when I batched enough cooking to last us like four four weeks. <laughs> I've done yeah. that. Yeah, yeah. I don't honestly obsessed. like I've gotten so used to batching work in the business now that it's like it's almost hard for me to imagine what people are doing day to day who who like don't batch. Like, I can't imagine like recording a single podcast episode, creating social graphics, writing an email, and then like moving on to like another chunk of tasks and then like repeating that every week. Like why? I know why people do resist it though, because it comes back to this thing of, I have to work really hard to make money and they feel like it's not in integrity if it's not in real time in some way. And I know when I create something, I'm in the flow of it. And it's, it's real. It, yeah. I, it's none of my business when someone consumes that because they usually consume it when they need it, not when I want to give it to them. And so I know with things like my newsletter, my social content, if I did it when I feel like it, it would be so inconsistent and that's okay. fine. But I batch, like I batch according to my schedule. And when I feel like it, it's just, it's keeping me and the business separate. Me as a person, I am not consistent. Me as a business, very consistent. Yeah. You, will, you will see a social post every single day. You will get three emails a week. You will get you know, a podcast every single week. They're separate. They're completely separate. Um, when I batch social media content, I might do it once or twice a month, but I, I treat it like a puzzle. And so I actually get really obsessed with how, how far in advance I can do it because it's like a puzzle. And I'm doing a puzzle at the moment with my son. You know, when it's really fun, you find the corner pieces and then uh -huh. you find the edges and then you find like all the things. I'm like that with batching. I'm like, okay, every Monday I'm going to do a post about like, what are our goals for the week? So I'll go and fill in all the Mondays as far as I can. And then I go, every Tuesday, I'm going to do an inspirational quote. Okay, I'll go and do that. And then I'll go every Friday, I'll do a post about this. And then it filled it in like a puzzle. And I remember one time I was doing this for my Rose farm because I do have an Insta for my farm. And Mark was like, hey, it's dinner. And I was like, I'm almost filled in the puzzle till December. I was like, I've just got a couple more. And then what I end up doing is um, like I'll do days, but then I'll do like every two weeks, I'll do a post about blah or every month I'll do a post about my piano at the farm. And so then I can see where the gaps are and I'm like, oh, oh. And I was just like, just a couple more because I just need to fill in a few more bits. And then it was, that's exciting to my brain instead of people thinking, but it sounds so boring to batch stuff because what am I going to, what am I going to talk about? How do I come up with that many things? I go, give yourself a category and let, let yourself yeah. run with it, fill in those corner pieces. And then it's super fun. And then there's still space. Like I still keep space for, um, you know, stuff that's happening in real time. I'll still share stuff on stories that's happening in real time. You can still go in at the start of the week and go, oh, yeah, okay, I can update this to be a little bit more relevant, but it's, but it's going to go out. It's going to go out if I don't do that. Yeah. It will happen one, regardless. One thing we, we had to do, so 
batching social content is the thing that it's been the hardest for me to do. And it has more to do with the fact that I'm like constantly wanting to do new things. So it's hard to like batch out the content because I'm like, well, what if, you know, five weeks from now I want to promote this thing, right? So kind of tricky. So to kind of fix that, we've just given up on like having a perfect Instagram grid. And so now we, we like batch the stuff that we know that we're going to do. And we do like what you said, we leave room in the schedule for, um, we only have like three set posts that go out a week. And then the other four days I could post about whatever the hell I want, if I really want to, but half the time I, I you know, don't. Exactly. Most and you do it with the easy pieces first. So right. for me, I know that I would, you know, every week I can put out a quote by an inspirational person. Yeah. And so I can, I can go and do those ahead of time. I mean, it's a bit easier with my farm because, you know, it's like every Monday I'm like, here's to the week ahead and I'll do a, you know, a picture of a rose or whatever. And I just go to my archives and I just do one category at a time. It's really, really easy for that one. But for my business, I still know that I'm going to be talking about certain pillars. I know that I'm still going to be sharing particular things, but then I give myself space. But sometimes if you give yourself too space, too much space, then you see people, they don't post for weeks and weeks. And then it feels yeah. hard to come back. Mm -hmm. you know it feels like oh I have to make a big announcement because I haven't been here so at least yeah, this do is, the low-hanging fruit this is me with um I actually owe my social media manager a back a, a batch of TikTok content tomorrow and uh I've been MIA on TikTok now for about four months four months which wow. she's not real happy about sorry Emily she's gonna listen to this episode and write our show notes but we're, we're gonna get back ah. on it well my TikTok person what we decided to do I would just put chuck stuff into a folder. So mm -hmm. anytime that I'm like inspired to do it, or if I've got nice hair and makeup or whatever, I'll just do anything. Sometimes I'll just be like, I'll just do a thing, a video of me working. Sometimes I'll speak to camera, whatever I've actually got energy for, I chuck it in a folder. And then a couple of times a week, she'll just go in there and she'll make a video out of it. Nice. And so all I have to do is just the front end bit for that. She does the hashtags. She does the tags. She, she knows my content. She can create it into something, but I don't have to think about it. I just chuck it in there. Love that. Okay. So we know you're on TikTok. You have the podcast. I do want to tell everyone, uh, your latest podcast episode is an absolute must listen for my audience. Oh, okay. Yeah. Do you it's about tax, right? Yes. So it's all about taxes. Do you remember what the title was or can you at least tell them like what the, oh. like what the topic is? Well, I wouldn't have written, I wouldn't have done too many about tax. So let me just see. I think it's just making, making friends with tax or getting over your tax things. Let me just have yes. a look at my thing. So you talk um, about like Denise talks how about- How to learn to love your tax bill. That's it. How to, to learn to love, to love your tax bill. bill. You talk about like some of the social services you received when you were younger and how it's made you like proud to pay into the system. Now I was listening to this yesterday. And it actually was making me think, I think about this a lot when I'm driving to, and to other people, this might sound kind of silly, but every time I get on the freeway here in Southern California, which is funded through our federal taxes, not every time, but every once in a while, I think like, man, how cool is it that I can just like get in my car whenever I want and drive where I can drive to the beach, I can drive to here. And I know that at the end of the day, my tax dollars paid for the tiniest fraction of this road. But like, that's where my money's going. And that's pretty cool. That's, that's what that I do. Cool. So I love this podcast topic. Yeah. Okay. So every time I talk about taxes and I release my tax returns publicly, I always do screenshots of it. And there's part of me that's always like, am I going to get into trouble for this? And I'm like, no, Who can I? I mean, I, I take off my tax file number, but you can look that up in Australia. You can look up anyone's company name and tax number in Australia. So even that I'm like, I don't even know. But people always then come in and say, oh, taxation is theft and it's, but, but, and I'm like, but that's the world we still live in. And so while we're in that framework, if you have massive issues with paying tax, you are going to hold back the size of your business. You really will, unless you want to get into massive tax structures or whatever. And like, I mean, I've got a great accountant. Of course, I deduct everything that I possibly can legally but I still have to pay essentially 25%, um, you know, company tax rate. And on a $4.6 million business last year, I think our profit was 2.6 million. That's a tax bill. Like yeah, you just can't get away from it. Come on, yes. do the numbers. 
Yes. Come on. Come uh, oh on. yeah. I mean, that's I, probably like six, I can see you going six to six to seven hundred thousand dollars in taxes. Yes, seven hundred thousand. Yeah, it was yeah. last year, and um, and then I have to pay personal tax because obviously I pay myself a salary, so then I'm a higher tax rate person there. I pay myself a tax efficient salary, but so over the last couple of years, on average, I pay about seven hundred thousand in tax every year for years, and I just do not expend any energy on it anymore. But the first year of my business, I had to go and see a tax person to register my business. I could get a free, you know, a free session with the tax guy. And he was like a, like a little accountant guy, you know, and I was, I was having a heart attack. I was sweating. I, my, my heart rate was up. I, and he was like, what's your business? And I was like, oh, I'm, a, I'm a life coach. And I'm talking about law of attraction. And he was just like, okay, so make sure, you know, you keep all your receipts. And, and I was like having a heart attack. So I had to do some exploration work around that for me. And for me, being in an office like that reminded me of being a little kid, going to the welfare office, getting into trouble, um, you know, even living in a country like Australia, which was colonized by the British, but they sent all their convicts to, to Australia. So we've got this you know, national sense of getting into trouble with the authorities. I remember watching Robin Hood as a kid and the, the sheriff of Nottingham would come around and try, get his tax money. And like, if you didn't have the money, like they took your kid or they like burnt your field, you know? So I had all this trauma that I had to deal with around paying taxes. And I knew that if I didn't deal with it, then I wouldn't allow myself to receive any money at the start of my business. And so now it's just like, I meet with my accountant quarterly, I pay tax. It's, it's no big deal. And I would be, I'm sure I'll pay even more in the future. And I'll yeah. have to probably look at the mindset issues around that too. Yeah. But, but I always say I'm my government's best investment because I did, I got welfare as a kid, you know, we got the equivalent of food stamps. Um, I got um, subsidies to go to university, be the first person in my family to go to university. I got so much help and I just got, I am my government's best investment. It is yeah. paid off immeasurably for them. Um, and I allow myself to, you know, to make even more money. I, yeah, I, I, I love that. And I really, I relate to that. Um, especially with my college was essentially state funded. So now it just feel nice to pay back into the system. So Denise, I want to make sure that you have some time, some time to get yourself ready for the next call. Um, I have one more question. Are you ready for it? Yes. Okay. Before I get to our final arts, a very, very serious question. So I'll, I'll give you a couple, like a, a few seconds to get ready for it. I, one more time, want to shout out your book. Everyone should go pre-order it, Chill and Prosper. While you're waiting for your pre-order to get there though, I also would encourage people to buy a copy of Get Rich Lucky Bitch. I'm a big fan. Listen to the, I read the book and listen to the audiobook. So that is going to be great as well. I took away a lot of life le lessons from that book and business lessons. So oh, yeah? huge fan. Tell me one, tell me one. Um, well, one thing, so I feel like you write this in the intro. Um, a lot of, a lot of what you write in the book is like pretty woo for me personally. Yeah. Some yeah, of the things, sure. but what I really appreciated about it is, and I could have made this up or I'm paraphrasing. Um, but in part of the book, you essentially say, you know what? A, a lot of this might sound pretty wacky to you, but clearly what you're doing now isn't working. So it's not going to hurt to try. And if one out of the 10 things really sticks, you know, that could be life-changing. So uh, oh, I did cool. the money I, I didn't tracking. even remember writing that, but I'm glad that you got that <laughs> out of it. That's good. Yeah. So you that's, what I, that's, my that's what I tell my life. students now. We actually, I call it, um, I actually have that book as semi-required reading for my students because we have a module on personal finance. Uh, and I tell everyone, there's tactical money tips you need to know, like where to invest your money. And then there's money mindset and it's two sides to one coin. And I'm not here to teach you money mindset. So go buy Denise's book. And then I and have vice a versa. I can't teach the financial stuff because that's not my, it's not my zone of genius. Um, you know, I'm not qualified to do it, but I, I think you have to merge those two. And yes. I think it's beautiful you know, a lot of people are scared to work with accountants or attorneys or 
see a tax person because they've got all this inner trauma. And I think anyone who works in the finance world, you have to understand the money mindset stuff that is going on for your clients. It's really important because they won't work with you because they'll be too scared. Absolutely. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. You got to work on both of these aspects. All right. So Denise, Great. our final question. Um, most of my audience knows if they don't know they're learning right now that I have a free Facebook group called Braden's Besties. So if anyone wants to be one of my besties, they need to go join the Facebook group. But if my audience would like to become one of your besties, what's the best way for them to do that? Well, I love that. And I, I call my community lucky bees uh -huh. um, because we can all be, you know, lucky bitches together. Um, and so I'm at denisedt.com and my social handle is at denisedt all across the web. And I, except TikTok, I think I couldn't get denisedt. It's Denise Duffield Thomas there but um, i love hearing people's stories so definitely reach out to me but my website is full of resources and stuff like that and then the pre-order page is at denisedt.com prosper beautiful and we will put all of those links in the show notes to make it nice and easy for everyone denise thank you so much for coming on the podcast oh well brayden thanks for having me back again and who knows we'll come i'll come back another time i'm sure we'll have more fun stuff to talk about yes we will be happy to have you